Well, as we prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's table, I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to the book of Romans, to Romans chapter 3. I want to bring a message tonight that is especially devoted to preparing our hearts for coming to the Lord's table. And so therefore, I want to speak of the salvation that is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. And specifically, I want to talk about the God of justification. I don't so much want to speak of the doctrine of justification, which we have traced out many times before together, but the God who stands behind this glorious truth by which we are acquitted before God, by which we receive a favorable verdict before the judgment bar of God, by which we have been forgiven and imputed the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ tonight to help us love this God yet more, I want to set before us from this text several of the attributes of God, several of the character qualities of the being of God that we might behold Him afresh. And as we come to the Lord's table tonight, to be struck afresh with how great our God is. One way that we love God yet more is to behold the beauty of who He is, that He is beauty, beautiful and majestic in His holiness and, and in His righteousness. And so I want to draw our attention tonight to the greatness of our God. It is our God who commissioned Christ to come into this world. It is our God who is the architect of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is our God who is the initiator of this so great salvation. It is our God who made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. It is this God who is the, the imputer of our sin to Christ. It is this God who has reckoned His righteousness to us. So standing behind this towering truth and doctrine of justification is the God of justification. And so tonight I want to draw our focus to the God who is just and the justifier. So I want to begin reading at verse 21 of Romans 3. And just to remind us to this point, there has been the presentation of the depravity of the entire human race, the radical corruption of the entire human race, which began in chapter 1, verse 18, and concludes in chapter 3, verse 20. Paul has made his case for the ruin of the entire human race. And that you will never find a more potent description of total depravity and radical corruption than what you find in verses 9 through 18 in this previous section. And so beginning in verse 21, it is the, the, the pivot point. It is the hinge on which the entire book of Romans now turns. And having made his case for our condemnation before a holy God, now beginning in verse 21, Paul presents the glorious doctrine of salvation. It begins in verse 21. It extends all the way through chapter 11. It is his monumental theological discourse with all of its nuances, all of its profundity, all the many planks of truth that need to be set in place that we would come to behold the, the extraordinary awesomeness of the salvation that is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Paul will conclude this presentation of salvation, he will... He will just simply say, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments, 
and unfathomable His ways. Paul is saying, I can't even wrap my arms around the infinite magnitude of this grace that has been lavished upon us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it all begins right here in chapter 3, verse 21. And where Paul begins is with the truth of justification. Throughout the history of the church, in her greatest hours, the church has come back to the primacy of preaching the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And it is by no coincidence that this is where the Apostle Paul begins the presentation of his case for salvation. He begins with the centrality of this truth in understanding salvation. It begins with justification. Calvin said that the doctrine of justification is the hinge upon which salvation turns. Martin Luther said that justification is the chief article of the church. And it is that for which the church either stands or falls. It would be impossible for us to overstate the importance of this truth tonight. My goal tonight is not to develop the doctrine of just justification, but to look at these verses, verses 21 to 26, and I don't know that we'll have time to look at all of them, but for us to look at them from another perspective. Rather than moving through it verse by verse, phrase by phrase, word by word, I instead want to hold up this truth and turn it and for us to see the God who stands behind this truth. What are the qualities about His life or His being that would bring to pass such a glorious truth that I would be acquitted before His judgment bar, that I would be forgiven, that I would be clothed with the perfect righteousness of Christ? Who is this God? So beginning in verse 21, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Let me stop here because I don't know that we'll be able to work our way beyond this, a dose of reality for myself at the moment. There is a sense in which all of the lines of theology intersect in the doctrine of justification. This doctrine is placed by God in such a strategic place in the greater body of divinity that it is as if every major doctrine in one way or another finds its intersection in the doctrine of justification. But more than that, without tracing out all of these lines... Christology, pneumatology, anthropology, harmatology, soteriology. The area of theology that is always taught first is what is known as theology proper, which is the study of the person of God Himself, specifically the first member of the Godhead. And in any study of theology proper, there is a study of the triunity of God, the character of God, the attributes of God, and the essence of God, 
and the existence of God as well as the decree of God. And there is a very real sense in which the lines of theology proper intersect in this doctrine of justification in such a unique way. So what I would like to do is start in verse 21 and to draw to your attention different attributes of God that make justification work. I want you to see the character qualities of God that stand behind this truth that move the doctrine of justification forward that it may find its fulfillment in our lives. First, I want you to note in verse 21, the faithfulness of God. As we begin in verse 21, we read, Now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets from the beginning of Old Testament time and throughout the annals of Old Testament history continually set forth the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the law and the prophets gave testimony to this truth of justification. In fact, the entire Old Testament was looking ahead with and speaking with promise of the coming of the One who would be, be the righteousness of God For sinners, and it was all witnessed by the law and the prophets again and again and again. God gave promise that there would come one who would provide the righteousness that we need in order to be declared right before God. If you'll turn back to chapter 1, verse 2, you will see at the very beginning of the book of Romans the faithfulness of God to deliver on his promises was made at the very outset. In verse 2, we're on the front steps of the front porch entering into this house of truth known as the book of Romans. And at the very beginning of our entrance onto the front porch of this book, Paul makes mention in verse 2 that the gospel of God was promised beforehand through His prophets in Holy Scripture. This is to tell us that the Gospel is not a new message for New Testament times. That the Gospel of Jesus Christ was preached and proclaimed throughout the entirety of the Old Testament beginning with the book of Genesis. And it would be according to the faithfulness of God that He would make good on His promises made in the Old Testament. Standing behind the doctrine of justification is the faithfulness of God who promised He would provide for us one who would give to us His righteousness. Later in verse 17 of chapter 1, there is the same effect. And this brings to conclusion the, the, the prologue of the book of Romans And verse 2 and verse 17 really serve somewhat as bookends for this opening prologue that reaffirm the very same point that God long ago promised. God promised that He would give righteousness to those who believe upon Him. And so in verse 17, for in it, the it refers back to the gospel of which Paul is not ashamed. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Now, justification is God declaring us to be righteous and He imputes His own righteousness to us because of our faith in Christ. And now to make his point, at the end of verse 17, Paul now quotes 
from the Old Testament. This is intentional. He did not need to quote from the Old Testament, but to show us the faithfulness of God. That what God promised in the Old Testament, He now is making good on His promise. So we read, as it is written, he quotes Habakkuk 2, verse 4, but the righteous man shall live by faith. There you have justification by faith in Christ alone. And the law of Moses, meaning Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books in the Old Testament, were penned by Moses. They are referred to as the Pentateuch, meaning the first five books. The law of Moses repeatedly bore witness that God would provide one who would be the Savior of His people and who would bring righteousness to them so that they might be right with God. The very first verse in which the gospel is made known in the Bible is Genesis 3 and verse 15 when the Lord said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall crush you on the head and you will bruise him on the heel. And in this, God promised, God promised that He would send one who would crush the head of the serpent and become the Savior of His people And Jesus understood exactly what His mission was here upon the earth. He said in John 12, verse 31, Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And in 1 John 3, verse 8, the apostle could not have been any more clear about this when he said the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. The law bore witness of this. This coming Savior who would be the righteousness of God for His people. In fact, this very messianic line is traced out in great detail in the book of Genesis. It foretold that this coming one would be the seed of Abraham, of the seed of Isaac, of the seed of Jacob, of the seed of Joseph, of the tribe of Judah. Later we would learn that he would be of the loins of David. The entire sacrificial system recorded in Exodus and Leviticus was but a foreshadowing of this coming One who would become our righteousness in justification. The Day of Atonement, the Passover... Levitical sacrifices, the priesthood, the ceremonial law were all pointing to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and God ratified that promise again and again and again. Further, the prophets spoke of this coming one. Isaiah spoke of the suffering servant. Uh, Zechariah spoke of the fountain for cleansing that sinners would be washed of their sins. The psalmist recorded the very words of Christ as He hung upon the cross. My God, my God, why have You forsaken Me? The law and the prophets foretold of the One who would come and provide the righteousness of God for His people. God pledged by His Word that He would do it. God is a covenant-keeping God. God is a promise-keeping God. In fact, Titus 1-2 says, God cannot lie. God promised long ages ago. And so what we see as we read Romans 3 and verse 1, we see shining through that verse and shining through the doctrine of justification, we see the faithfulness of God to not be diverted from His plan, to stay the course and to make good on His Word, to provide for us one who would give to us His perfect righteousness. 
Beloved, tonight as we come to the Lord's table and as we bring the elements to you, please be reminded of how faithful God is to you. All of His promises are yea and amen. He prophesied. He promised. He has delivered on His Word. The faithfulness of God. This God remains faithful to every other promise. He is faithful to you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He will meet your needs according to His riches in Christ Jesus. He is faithful to you. Others will disappoint you. Others will break their word. Others will break their promises. God will never be unfaithful to you. As we come to the Lord's table, we are reminded of the faithfulness of our God. There's a second attribute that I want you to note. And these attributes define and describe the being of God. These attributes, if you would allow me just a moment, are like holding up a diamond to the noonday sun. And the light of the sun comes shining into and through this diamond and it refracts the light and there is broken out the different colors of the rainbow out from the light that is shining into this diamond. When we hold up the Word of God before our eyes, there, is, there are these attributes of God that are separated out and they speak of the glory of our God. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. And shining through this doctrine of justification, we see the beauty of these different character qualities, attributes of God, and it should cause our hearts to be overwhelmed, to be drawn to this God. Our God is not a capricious God like the gods of the Romans and the Greeks and, and, and Greek mythology, the inventions of, of men's minds who are contradictions within themselves and who all have their, their quirks about them and their idiosyncrasies as you would read Roman uh, and Greek mythology. Those are not gods to be worshipped. Those are gods to be pitied. But the one true living God is infinitely perfect in His being. He is all glorious in the entirety of who He is. And when we behold who He is, our eyes should be overwhelmed to behold such a God as this faithfulness of God, the promises that He made throughout the law and the prophets, now the righteousness of God. That is what we see in this doctrine. We see in verse 21, now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. What that says is, as we study the truth of sinners being justified by God, there is, to use Paul's own words here, there is a manifestation of the righteousness of God. There is a revelation. There is a demonstration of the righteousness of God. It is clearly set before our eyes. We see it again in verse 22. Even the righteousness of God... We see it again in verse 25. This was to demonstrate His righteousness. That's what this truth does. It demonstrates His righteousness. We who are believers and who have been given eyes to see, 
when we look in pages of Scripture and we see that God is the justifier of sinners, we see the righteousness of God. It is shining brighter than 10,000 suns in the sky above. Only a blind man could not see his righteousness. We see it again in verse 26. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness. This truth showcases the righteousness of God. This truth is a theater that puts on display The righteousness of God, it comes shining forth through this doctrine. We don't want to be like children just playing with word studies on the floor. We want to see the big picture. We want to see the God behind justification. We want to see His glory put on display through this truth. Now, what is righteousness? There are two aspects of righteousness. And it has been well said that the role of the theologian is to speak of distinctives within truths. And for us to understand the righteousness of God, there is a careful twofold distinction that we must make. There is the active righteousness of God, and there is also the passive righteousness of God. The active righteousness of God means that He must punish sin. And He must reward good. He must punish sin and He must reward good. Genesis 2, 7, In the day that you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. Now, the faithfulness of God is at stake now. God has said it. Will He follow through with it? And in the day that Adam ate of the fruit, immediately he died spiritually. He progressively died emotionally. And He ultimately died physically. And God set in motion death the very moment that Adam sinned. Romans 6, verse 23, The wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18, verse 3, The soul that sins shall surely die. I want you to know that every sin in the history of the world will be punished directly by God. Right now, we would, get the impre- we would have the impression that there is no punishment for sin. Every sin in the history of the world will be punished by God. Whether punished eternally in hell are punished vicariously in Christ, every sin will be punished by the active righteousness and the active justice of God. Also, God will reward conformity to His law. And on the last day, when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ and He gives His reward and says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, It will be the active righteousness of God that will bestow His reward to those who have walked in a manner and served in a manner that brings glory and honor to Him. And according to our faithfulness, He will give His active righteousness. And so by this, He both punishes sin and He rewards conformity to His law. That is so important for us to understand in the doctrine of justification because in this doctrine, all of our sins are punished to the full in Christ. 
And there is also the passive righteousness of God, which is the gift of righteousness. We are passive in the sense that we receive it from God as a gift, and we are declared to be the very righteousness of God in Christ. This was the breakthrough point for Martin Luther at the beginning of the Reformation, that he came to see that the righteousness of God was not the active righteousness that God demanded of him, for he knew he couldn't keep the law. It was the passive righteousness that he would give to sinners on the basis of faith. As we come to the Lord's table tonight, let us all stand in awe and amazement of our God that He has punished all of our sins in full in Christ and has given to us the perfect obedience of Christ now reckoned to our account. There's a third attribute of God that I want you to note. And it is so important. It is found in verse 23. In verse 23, we see the holiness of God. Note verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in this context, glory of God represents the holiness of God. The holiness of God is the standard by which each one of us is measured. Now, I've told you before to make another theological distinction The glory of God is used in two ways. There is the intrinsic glory of God and there is the ascribed glory. The intrinsic glory of God is the sum and the substance of the entirety of His divine character. It is the the entirety of the essence of God. All of His perfections comprise the intrinsic glory of God. I cannot give intrinsic glory to God. God is who He is. From everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God, and He never changes forever the same. He is the God who was and who is and who shall be forever. That glory is untouchable. I can't diminish it. I can't increase it. God is who God is. And then there is a scribe glory, which is the glory we do give to God. It is the glory of praise and the glory of worship that we ascribe to Him. And the more we behold His intrinsic glory, the more we ascribe glory to Him. The higher our view of the intrinsic glory of God, the higher will be the ascribed glory given to God. In verse 23... Paul speaks not of ascribed glory. He speaks of intrinsic glory. And what he is saying is we will be measured by the intrinsic glory of God. And we fall short. And this intrinsic glory is the holiness of God. The holiness of God is the sum and substance of all of the attributes of God. And that is precisely what intrinsic glory is. Now, I want you to picture a set of scales. We've talked about this before, but let us rehearse this again. Some people think that this is the way it will be in the end. Here are scales. There are two sides to the scales. And God will take all your good deeds and put them on one side of the scales. And God will take all your bad deeds and put them on the other side of the scales. And depending upon which way the scales go, you're either right with God or you're not right with God. Well, of course, we all know here tonight the travesty that that human conception is. Because just one sin, just one, would be such a revolt against the intrinsic glory of God. Just one sin 
would be sufficient to damn our soul in hell forever. Other people see it a different way. They see the same scales and they say, no, it's like this. The entirety of my life is put on one side of the scales and on the other side, there'll be some drunk pulled out of the gutter and put on the other side of the scales. And see, I'm better than he is. I have more good than what he has. And so therefore, I will be right with God because I'm better than someone else. The only problem is the divine standard by which all of us are measured is not anyone else. Now, we take these scales, and on one side of the scales, there is the entirety of our lives. And be rest assured, God is taking impeccable records and keeping impeccable books. Every thought, every deed, every word, every motive, there it is. And on the other side of the scales is the intrinsic glory of God. I want to tell you, we all fall so far infinitely short of the intrinsic glory and perfect holiness of God that there is no way that we can be right before God. And some of us here in this room may have done maybe a little deed of something good more than someone else, helped a widow across the street to maybe put on your little side of the scale, but the fact is, it's like the old illustration we used to use in college when we were witnessing that line up the whole human race on the coast of America and in order to get to heaven, you've got to jump over the entire Atlantic Ocean and land in Europe. Now, some of us could maybe jump 20 feet. Others who are less athletic maybe could jump 10 feet. But the fact is, we end up so far short of being able to land on the other side, it really doesn't matter. Verse 23 says, We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, here is the truth in justification. Just to complete this thought, take these same scales again, and on one side of the scales is the intrinsic glory of God. God is light in Him. There is no darkness at all. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The moral, pure, perfection of the character of God on one side of the scales. And when we believe upon Jesus Christ, on the other side of the scales is placed the perfect righteousness and perfect obedience of Christ Himself. Jesus, who is co-equal with God the Father... Jesus, who is co-eternal with God the Father. Jesus, who is equally righteous as God is righteous. It is the righteousness of Christ that is now imputed to us, reckoned to us, and now for the first time these scales are perfectly balanced. It is only because in justification God gives to us the righteousness of Christ, and no one else has perfect righteousness. No other man, no one else has lived under the law and been able to keep it perfectly. No one else has perfectly obeyed God in attitude and in deed, both everything He should have done as well as not doing everything He should not have done. Perfect conformity to the moral law of God. That righteousness is what is deposited to my account. Thus, the scales are perfectly in balance. It is the holiness of God that is shining brighter than 10,000 suns. 
through this diamond that is refracting and revealing the holiness of God through this truth. I cannot come before God. I cannot find acceptance with God. I am unholy. Yet He has provided the only way by which I may come into His presence. This holy God has provided a holy Savior. This holy God has provided a holy righteousness for me. This holy God has provided holy forgiveness and holy salvation that I would be perfectly accepted before God. It is the faithfulness of God. It is the righteousness of God. It is the holiness of God. Let's take one more. It is shining through this truth the sovereignty of God. You will note in verse 24 the first two words being justified. To be justified by God means that we stand in His courtroom and that He is the supreme judge of heaven and earth. There is no higher court of appeal. There is no higher jurisdiction. We stand in the courtroom of Him who is sovereign over heaven and earth and whatever He declares to be so, that is what is so. And it is this God on the basis of my faith in this righteous Savior that I am declared to be righteous and the gavel of God comes down in His courtroom in heaven and because of His sovereignty, it is an irrevocable declaration. It is irreversible. It can never be appealed. No one else can bring accusation against me that will reverse the charge. Because God is infinitely and absolutely sovereign. And because He has declared us to be justified, we are forever justified before God. There will never be an overturning of His pronouncement, this is based upon the sovereignty of God. That is why Romans 8, 29 and 30 says, Those whom He foreknew, He predestined, and whom He predestined, He called, and whom He called, He justified, and whom He justified, He glorified. All whom He has declared to be justified shall be forever glorified. No charge will ever be brought against you and me that will overturn the verdict of God. Because God is sovereign. No one can burst into the courtroom above with any new evidence that would bring accusation against us At the right hand of God the Father is our Advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the propitiation for our sins. We are forever justified because of the sovereignty of our God. Romans 8, verse 31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, Who is against us? Who is greater than God? Who is above God? Who could overturn God? If God is for us, who can be against us? It is the sovereignty of God that stands behind the doctrine of justification and guarantees the finality and the irreversibility of the verdict that has been given by God. Romans 8.33 Who will bring a charge 
against God's elect? It's a rhetorical question. There is no answer given because there is no one who can bring a charge against us that will stick. God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? There is only one gavel in the courtroom of heaven. And it is God's gavel and it is His omnipotent right arm that has brought it down and declared us to be right. It is the sovereignty of God that comes shining through this truth that has sealed the verdict never to be overturned. Let me give you just quickly one last one. The grace of God, verse 24. Look at it. And we know this. It needs no amplification. Being justified as a gift by His grace. (laughs) There is the grace of God in all of this. None of this on the basis of my merit. None of this on the basis of my deserving this to be so, not on the basis of any good works, good deeds that I have done, entirely and exclusively by the free grace of God. We are completely unable to find favor with Him. But it is His grace, which is His unmerited, undeserved favor that has brought this to pass. It's not because of me that I am justified. It is in spite of me that I am justified. Does anyone here tonight feel unworthy? Does anyone here tonight feel undeserving? We all should feel this. We are measured against the perfect intrinsic glory of God. We all fall so short. The reason that God has justified us is found entirely in God Himself. It is not found in anything in us. The grace that has welled up in the heart of God is undeserving favor being bestowed upon wicked, rebellious, vile sinners such as we all are. The grace of God is pouring through this doctrine of justification. Tonight there is now therefore no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus Would you like a definition of justification in simplest terms? No condemnation. That is the antonym for justification. It is condemnation. There is now therefore no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. We are fully acquitted. The verdict of divine favor has come upon us. Someone has well said, justification is defined as just as if I have never sinned. I want to go one step further. It is just as if I have always obeyed. That is the justification that has been imputed to your account. Just as if you have never sinned and just as if you have always obeyed. This is the center plank. This is the center plank of all doctrines of salvation. And all the lines of theology intersect in this truth. And all of the attributes of God also intersect here. When you go home tonight, you can take the rest of this chapter And you can look for other attributes of God as well. And it will be a blessing to your heart and soul 
to discover the greatness of your God in this truth. Let us pray. Father, we thank You for declaring us to be righteous based upon the perfect righteousness of Your Son, Jesus Christ. As we have been acquitted of all charges, we want to see You in this truth. We want to see You and savor You. We want to behold You. And we want to love You. That You have done this on our behalf. This is not an abstract truth. This is a very personal reality that has been brought to pass because of who You are. As we now come to the Lord's table... We ask that You would bless us, Your people. May we all stand strong in our first love for Christ. In Jesus' name, Amen. The following has been an audio recording of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church and is under the direct copyright of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church. All recordings may be used freely for the ministry and application of the Word of God. However, written permission must be obtained from Christ Fellowship Baptist Church before any recording is broadcast or redistributed in any form. In no way should this recording be disseminated without the express consent of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church.